Hello and welcome to the training session for ultrasound in patients with coronavirus. This module will be about lung ultrasound for COVID-19. Today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to discuss basic lung ultrasound, just get a baseline for how to do lung ultrasound, and then discuss briefly machine settings that we need to know to be able to do the ultrasound, and then finally to talk about findings specific to coronavirus patients uh, in the lung for ultrasound. Just by way of background though, COVID-19 began in China in late December as a new virus that caused pneumonia at, with an alarming mortality. The first I heard of this virus was on the radio um, around January 20th uh, of this year, but, and this was based out of some reporting from the Wall Street Journal that ran the day before on January 19th uh, about this new pneumonia-like virus in China that was killing people over there. Uh, when you look back, the original study, original article that was published in the Wall Street Journal was on January 9th. So that's kind of when things started hitting the news over here and when we kind of first first learned about this thing. That being said, fast forward to today, um, and as of the recording of this uh this lecture on April 9th, about 1.5 million people in, in the worldwide have been diagnosed with the coronavirus uh, and has killed almost 90,000 people. And I'm sure by the time we're done with this, these numbers are going to be vastly different. <clears throat> that being said, um, based on projections from the United States, it looks to be that um, in our country alone, we may see about between 40 and 100,000 deaths. Um, and some estimates, though they may be a little bit bullish, indicate that perhaps up to 50% of the United States population will, will have some exposure to the, the coronavirus. Now, this comes in the context of a century of global pandemics, and I think it's helpful to kind of understand coronavirus in, in light of what's been happening in the last century. Uh, back in 2014, we had the Ebola uh, pandemic that killed about 11,000 people. 2009 was the H1N1 influenza pandemic, which killed 500,000 people. Uh, back in 2002, we had SARS, which killed very few people. Uh, the HIV epidemic began kind of in the 1970s and continued on into the, the 2000s, uh, killing about 36 million people. And in the 1950s and 60s, we had various different strains of the influenza virus, killing um, several million people each. But the, the big one, the big mother of them all, is 1918, uh, the Spanish flu, uh, which is an influenza-based uh, pandemic uh, that was worldwide and killed between 20 and 50 million people. Now, while coronavirus is probably Probably not going to be close to that scale, um, hopefully not anywhere close to that scale, uh, it is helpful to kind of understand what's going on and kind of the actions that are to be taken from a public health standpoint and even a, a local health standpoint in that context. Now, the coronavirus itself is a novel virus. Um, we have exposure to this. It's part of the, the coronavirus family. Um, but it is a new strain of coronavirus that we've identified. It's enveloped, non-segmented, pos positive sense uh, RNA beta coronavirus. Uh, it shares a similar homology to the SARS virus and the MERS virus that have come out uh, a couple a couple decades ago, um, and about 80% genetically similar to SARS. The virus capsule itself is about 100 na 120 nanometers in diameter, which becomes important later as we think through kind of the, the infectivity um, and in the ultrasound findings uh, of this particular virus. The mutation rate at this point seems to be somewhat lower than influenza. One study that I read indicates that the viral strains that were identified, or at least studied uh, pathologically, uh, had a 99% homology at the nucleotide level and a 99% homology at the protein expression level. Um, one less than scientific study that was posted online uh, suggested that the mutation rate of the SARS virus or the SARS-CoV-2 or co coronavirus or COVID-19 coronavirus was about half that of influenza. So hopefully, uh, if these are true, the the variants um, that we may see will be will be decreased uh, and have implications for recrudescence later on in the season. The R ot for this particular virus is two to three, um, which means basically two to three people will become infected for every one person that's infected. So if you get Get it you'll infect two to three people beyond you um you know while you have this thing which basically is at a level that's significant enough for human human transmission to cause a pandemic and these are things that we know and the r here is similar to that of influenza so it kind of gives us an idea um, of the the characteristics of this this disease from a clinical standpoint though uh it presents as a broad spectrum of diseases i mean we've seen coronaviruses in our daily 
practice and probably didn't even know about it just because it produced some mild upper respiratory symptoms that we, um, we were not terribly concerned about. So about 81% of the patients who get the coronavirus or COVID-19 will have uh, minim- will be minimally symptomatic uh, with symptoms ranging from mild upper respiratory symptoms all the way through to kind of some mild pneumonia. About 14% of patients will be cat- categorized as moderate um, in that they'll have they'll have pneumonia, right? They'll be moderate to severe pneumonia uh, and present with dyspnea, present with hypoxia, things like that. About 5% of patients with COVID-19 uh, will be severe, right? They'll have... Um, They'll be severely affected with respiratory failure, ARDS, right? Shock, uh, multi-organ system failure. And this is concerning cohort uh, because in the patients who have the severe disease, there's an estimated about 49% mortality. And this is data coming out of the CDC. So this is the population where we're going to spend a ton of medical resources uh, in trying to identify and mitigate um, the, the, the effects of the disease in, in this category. So why ultrasound, right? Why are we spending time learning about ultrasound uh, for coronavirus patients? Why have we as a hospital purchased a bunch of ultrasound machines and deploying them throughout the hospital for our COVID response, right? This is more than just an opportunity to get on the bandwagon and get more more toys, um, more than more more than an opportunity just to for sonophiles to scan more things, right? There's good reasons why we're taking the time to learn and to do ultrasound. First, ultrasound can lead to an earlier diagnosis, especially when testing is not as available as we'd like it to be, right? The COVID particle, like I said, is believed to be about 120 nanometers in diameter. So as a result, it's believed that this tends to settle down into the distal alveoli uh, and attach to the airways, well, attach to any parts of the airways, but especially down in the distal alveoli. Early CT studies out of China show that the vast majority of findings are in the periphery along the you know, out by the pleura, uh, and appear even before the patient is symptomatic, right? And since ultrasound has a high concordance with CT for peripheral findings, ultrasound can then be used to make the diagnosis of viral pneumonia. Secondly, ultrasound allows us to monitor the progression of disease. Once the diagnosis is made, there's an inevitable inevitable progression of this disease. It's just going to happen, right? You progress through this ground glass opacity appearance all the way up to kind of more of a consolidated pneumonia. And CT studies have demonstrated this progression from findings, like I said, from those ground glass opacities to worsening reticular disease. And this progression can be monitored even at the bedside with ultrasound, especially in patients who are not able to be moved to a traditional imaging suite. Third, ultrasound can be used to monitor lung findings, um, especially for those patients um, who are mechanically ventilated, right? Because this has impacts on our management of these vented patients. may help us understand whether or not we can start weaning a patient uh, based on the lung findings. And it also can help us understand and troubleshoot kind of what's going wrong when we have vent malfunctions. Ultrasound uh, is when used to make the diagnosis and to monitor the progression of the disease means that fewer people need to be involved, right? It's the the provider at the bedside that's monitoring this, resulting in decreased utilization for PPE, right? We don't need to take people in and out of rooms. We don't have to expose transporters. And if we're taking patients to traditional imaging suites, we don't have to then expose the personnel that are manning those suites uh, as well as the, the equipment there. And this will result in the decreased need for PPE utilization, decreased exposure to hospital staff, therefore decreased um, infection of the hospital staff, and also um, decreased downtime of the radiology equipment uh, that would then need to be subsequently decontaminated after the patient's been in the radiology suite. Finally, ultrasound can assist in making alternate diagnoses. While coronavirus or COVID-19 is on the forefront of our minds right now, um, and we tend to anchor on the coronavirus or COVID as the source of the patient's symptoms, we need to remember that patients still with respiratory symptoms, right, still have other problems, right? The patients with asthma, COPD, heart failure, cardiac ischemia, pneumothorax, as in this situation, may still present that way, right? They may not have coronavirus as the cause of their shortness of breath. And so ultrasound can be helpful in terms of Uh, pointing us um, in the right direction, whether that be toward a viral pneumonia or away from a viral pneumonia and toward another etiology of disease. So before we get into ultrasound for coronavirus patients, let's first start by talking about lung ultrasound in general. Let's set a framework and a, a foundation that we can build upon then as we talk about what the ultrasound findings for coronavirus are. Right? And some of this may be a review. That's okay. Uh, for some people, this may be new material. Right? 
So big picture, right? Just think very broadly. And I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but bro very broadly, and we'll kind of zero back in. The lungs, right? We have two of them. They live inside the chest, right? They are deep to the ribs, right? Based on their acoustic properties, it has traditionally been believed that lungs uh, are not really amenable to ultrasound, right? We, ultrasound typically just doesn't look through air and look through bone very well. Um, but there are artifacts produced by the lungs that allow us to evaluate the lung tissue with ultrasound. And a lot of the baseline work for this has been done uh, by a guy named Dan Lichtenstein out of France, who's an intensivist, uh, a couple decades ago, where he laid the foundation for, oh, we can actually see things with lung artifacts. And there's been a plethora of research since then um, further honing um, the, our ability to do lung ultrasound. So if we dive into the lung itself, right, and do a cross section of the thorax, um, what you'll see uh, moving from outer to inner uh, is the skin and sub subcutaneous tissue as its first layer, right? Just deep to the skin and subcutaneous tissue layer are the ribs and the, the intercostal muscles, right? And just deep to that layer is the pleura, right? The, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Um, and then just deep to that is going to be the lungs. When we apply acoustic principles of ultrasound, can even in the schematic appearance, what we're going to see is a characteristic profile, right? Bones, since they don't, since they reflect ultrasound and don't, um, don't really transmit ultrasound very well, we're going to see this hyperechoic cortex with a deep shadow beneath it, right? So we see on this screen the hyperechoic cortex in a deep shadow of these ribs. And just beneath that, we have this bright, thin, crisp, and continuous echogenic line uh, that represents the pleural line, right? And deep to that, that gray is kind of the, the hazy, dirty shadowing artifact uh, of air in the lung tissue itself. So let's actually take a look at an ultrasound image, right? So if we apply this to the image, we can see bookending either side of this screen, this image on the screen is we have the bone, right? We have the ribs, that hyperechoic cortex in the deep, dark columns of shadows that are deep to that uh, from those ribs, right? And then immediately distal or immediately deep, excuse me, to those ribs is a hyperechoic thin echogenic line and that represents the pleural line right and it's important to identify this or identify the ribs because it's easy to confuse the pleural line with other echogenic lines just look up in the superficial tissues in that subcutaneous layer and you see a fascial line right it could be really easy to mistake that for the pleura uh, rather than the true pleura that's deeper to it if we don't first positively identify the ribs so you have to look for the ribs because that's going to be the landmark that's going to guide you to the pleural line now, going back to the schematic, as we take breaths, right, as we breathe in, as we breathe out, the lung's going to expand and the lung's going to contract, right? The visceral and the parietal pleura will then slip back and forth smoothly. And this movement is visible in ultrasound and is something that we call lung sliding. In the normally breathing or normally vented patient, you should see movement along the pleural line. And that represents the movement of the visceral pleura against the parietal pleura, right? And in this example, we can see as I'm taking a breath in and out, you can see the, the lung sliding, that pleura sliding back and forth uh, underneath those ribs. This can be documented or further evaluated in M mode. Uh, when you put the M mode caliper through that interspace, it has to be through the interspace, not over the rib, but through that interspace, the granular texture below the pleural line represents the movement of the lung, and the linear appearance above the pleural line represents the lack of movement in the chest wall. This is often called the sandy beach sign, uh, where the lung tissue is the sand, right? Everything that's underneath that, uh, that M mode line is displayed out over time on the right-hand side of this screen. And so you can see if something's moving, it's certainly not going to stay the same from millisecond to millisecond so it's going to have that granular appearance whereas the chest wall rel represents relative lack of movement uh, as it pertains to this line and so there's going to be a very striated or linear appearance because things just really aren't moving that much um, so we get the waves of the sea representing the represented in the chest wall in the sand uh, of the beach represented by the lung the moving lung tissue now, when a patient has a pneumothorax, there is separation of that visceral and that parietal pleura, right? The, there's um, no direct apposition of those two different layers. And so there's no direct movement that's going to be visualized, right? Any movement that you happen to be seeing is going to be out of the screen because there's air interposed between the two. We're just not going to be able to see it. Uh, so we'll have lack of lung sliding in the context of pneumothorax. 
And since there's no movement above and below the pleural line, there's a linear and streaky appearance of the M mode tracing all the way from the near field through the far field, right? Giving it the streaky barcode type appearance. In fact, the, if you want to give it a name, you could call it the barcode sign. Right? Now, this technique is pretty accurate for diagnosing pneumothoraces. It definitely outperforms traditional chest x-ray, at least in the supine context. When you put when the, the patient upright, changes the, the sensitivity and specificity of the x-ray a little bit, but it still outperforms the chest x-ray. However, one thing that's got to remember is anything that prevents the movement of visceral and parietal pleura against one another can cause this sonographic finding, right? Even if there's no pneumothorax. So while the sensitivity is good, right, if you see lung sliding, there is no pneumothorax at that place. The specificity is poor for pneumothorax because of things like talc pleuridesis, where you have an adherence of the visceral and the parietal pleura, or even right main stem intubation if you're looking at the left, or apnea. Now I would posit that this is probably a poor way of diagnosing apnea, but if you have a patient who's not breathing, you will have a lack of lung sliding. And by proxy, you'll see an image that looks very similar to this, right? Now, as we drill down into coronavirus patients, one specific application for COVID-19 is in troubleshooting the mechanically vented patient. Remember, one of the important complications in mechanical ventilation is that it can cause respiratory decline when a pneumothorax is present or when the tube is obstructed, right? When patients have a pneumo, they will lose lung sliding on the affected side. And similarly, when patients have a loss of lung sliding, you should worry about you know, pneumothorax or tube displacement in the esophagus, especially if the thing's bilateral. Um, you have a dis progressive distension in the stomach. Those are things that should clue you into the fact that your tube's not in the right place or the lungs aren't working as properly. Now, as we go back to the lung itself, remember that when we get out of the terminal bronchi in, into the alveoli of the lungs, the walls of the alveoli and the interstitial tissue is very, very thin, right? And this allows for gas exchange. I and mean, that's the whole point of it. So you can have adequate gas exchange into the capillary bed um, in the lungs. And there's, and as such, there's a certain air fluid ratio for the healthy lung, right? There's a very high ratio, a lot of air relative to the fluid and tissue, uh, inside a normal lung. And when this air fluid ratio is high, you will have a typical air appearance with a hyperechoic pleural line, and then the dirty shadowing deep to it, right? So in this situation, we see in the patient's rib, rib in the pleural line there, and then deep to that, we have this dirty shadowing, uh, and a re a reverberation artifact of that pleural line representing what we call an A profile, right? This is called the A profile and represents normal appearing healthy lung. Um, however, in patients with obstructive problems, COPD, asthma, things like that, you will also have an A profile, right? This basically just demonstrates the fact that there's a normal air to fluid ratio. Doesn't tell you about the functioning of the lung. So it's best to consider an A, a profile as representative of norm normal air fluid or A for air profile. Right. As things become pathologic in the lungs, right, as the interstitial area becomes thickened, whether that be from edema, inflammatory infiltrate, whatever, the ratio of air to fluid will change, right? The air portion will go down and the fluid portion will go up. And consequently, the lung ultrasound will take on what's more of what's called a B profile. And that's what we see in this image here. When the thickening of the interstitial tissue happens, we develop B lines on ultrasound, right? Those are the, the, the B lines are basically defined as the vertical white lines that start from the pleural surface and extend to the far field and obliterate A lines. So as we can see in this, this image here, the B lines will start up here in the, at the pleural line and go all the way down through the far field. It m looks much like shining a flashlight through fog at night, right? Now, since our air or since our lungs aren't completely bone dry, we all have some amount of tissue. We all have some amount of fluid in our lungs. There will be some amount of B lines in our lungs normally. They tend to congregate in the bases. They tend to congregate posteriorly. Uh, tend to be less prevalent up in the the apices and anteriorly. But we may have some from time to time. Right. Up to three B lines per interspace is considered normal. Once you start going beyond three lines uh, per interspace, then this is what represent what we consider represents pathology, right? <clears throat> this may certainly represent pulmonary edema, as in the case of, of the image that we have here, but it can also represent viral pneumonias or pulmonary contusions or ARDS or even things like pulmonary fibrosis, right? Anything that thickens that interspace and Anything that thickens that interstitial tissue or puts fluid in that interstitial tissue is going to cause this B profile. It's important to assess whether the B lines are unilateral versus bilateral, focal versus diffuse, 
because uh, this has implications for what the etiology is, right? Beelines look like beelines, but where they are, how diffuse they are, uh, and what the clinical pr presentation is of the patient is really going to determine what's causing this thing. So for example, a patient with cardiogenic pulmonary edema is going to have diffuse B lines bilaterally throughout the entire lung fields, whereas someone with a viral pneumonia may have a patchy appearance of B lines that may be bilateral, may be, uh, may be unilateral, may be in certain places, but not others. And similarly, patients with pulmonary contusions will have B lines in the area of that contusion, but certainly not in the non-contused lung. As the alveoli are filled in with fluid uh, or, or other debris from the, from the inflammatory or infectious process, right, the lung will take more of a consolidated appearance, mimicking other solid tissues such as the liver. Consolidations take on a range of appearance, ranging from kind of the shredded pleural line, uh, which we see uh, over on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, to the left, uh, shredded pleural line here, to more of a consolidated appearance that we see here. Initially, small consolidations at the pleural surface will appear as kind of that shredding, that normally thin, crisp pleural line, right? And this image is of, is of pneumonia in neonate and shows that, that shredded pleural line, right? Here you can see that loss of the smooth architecture and some B lines distal to that or deep to that. Uh, and as the consolidation grow, more and more lung tissue will be involved in producing this tissue appearance uh, with echogenic air bronchograms. So as the inflammation happens, the fluid is filling the alveoli, air is being crowded out, and now the lung tissue is actually taking on more of a tissular type appearance, much like other surrounding tissues, because the air is not there to block the the view of the, uh, with the ultrasound. That being said, we see all these little echogenic foci in here, and these are just little discrete pockets of air, whether they be an alveoli or, or the terminal bronchial, or bronchioles um, that hasn't been completely flooded out or crowded out by the inflammatory process. Right? And these, these consolidations might become very large. In the case of a lobar pneumonia, oftentimes you'll see an increased density um, of B lines around the periphery, but you'll still see that consolidation in the middle, right? So in this situation, we have a very large consolidation, right? We see some air bronchograms inside it, and then the, the enhanced, the, the, uh, the B line appearance around this consolidation representing the thickened interstitial space, the inflamed interstitial space that hasn't completely crowded out all the air that's inside of it. The final thing that we can see on an ultrasound um, of the lungs, just for basic overview of ultrasound, is pleural fluid, right? Oftentimes, this appears as an anechoic fluid above the diaphragm that pushes the lung up and out of the way, right? Uh, however, depending on the etiology of the fluid, it can be echogenic, and it certainly contains some septations. For example, a patient with an empyema or a hemothorax may have echogenicity within that uh, pleural fluid, or a patient with an infectious process may have adhesions um, causing a septated appearance uh, in that pleural fluid, right? The lung will oftentimes appear consolidated, as we see over on the left-hand side of the screen here. The lung is consolidated here. Sometimes this can be from pneumonia. Certainly if you have a pneumonia with a paranemonic effusion, uh, that can cause um, this effusion type appearance, and in that you'll oftentimes see those air bronchograms like we saw in the previous image. However, sometimes this is just compressive atelectasis. As the fluid fills that thorax, it's going to displace the lung upwards and cause compression of that lung tissue. And you can see that compressed lung uh, in a very tissular type appearance here. So moving on, let's talk about machine settings, right? This becomes a really important topic to do lung ultrasound because you need to optimize the machine so that you're better able to see what you're wanting to see uh, in the lung. Because the, the lung ultrasound is very dependent on machine settings, right? The first question is, which transducer do you use? Really, really, you can use any of the three standard transducers for lung ultrasound. There are advantages and disadvantages for each of them, certainly. Uh, the most common one that you'll see either in textbooks or in literature or probably in practice is using the linear transducer for lung ultrasound. And this is a great transducer because it gives you a nice, high-resolution image of the pleural surface, right? Being high-frequency, it doesn't allow for great penetration, right? But it shows high resolution in those near fields. And so you get really crisp views of the ribs and that pleural line, kind of what's going along, going on along that pleural line. That being said, the major drawback to this transducer is its lack of ability to penetrate deeply into the lung. So artifacts that are that extend deeper or that you need to see deeper to, to really adequately visualize and uh, will be harder to see because you just can't get a great far field view with a linear transducer. So I personally like to use the curvilinear or the phased array when I do lung ultrasound. 
I realize that this sacrifices some clarity along the plural line, but it allows for a greater penetration, which basically I think allows for better visualization of that far field. I think when you look for B lines, um, and even when you look for some consolidations, it really pulls those B lines out a lot better than the, the linear transducer does because it just have more real estate in which you can see it. You'll be able to see the consolidation. You'll be able to see those B lines around the, the periphery of that consolidation extending all the way into the far field. Now, as for machine settings, you'll want to pick the lung preset in your machine. If you've got a point of care ultrasound machine, you probably have a lung preset because most vendors have included a lung preset in their machines basically because lung ultrasound has become a thing in point of care ultrasound um, over the last several decades. So most machines should have a lung preset. On the left, you'll see an example of one of our machines in the emergency department where we have a lung preset. And on the right, you see an example using the butterfly app uh, when you're scanning with the butterfly uh, that there's a lung preset, right? And it's important that you want to pick these presets because it optimizes the machine settings that allow for best visualization of lung, right? The lung the ultrasound in general is going to have some filters like compound imaging filters and harmonic filters. And when you pick the lung presets, it will turn off those filters, right? Now, these filters tend to smooth out the image. And if you're doing a fast exam, doing a gallbladder, or kidney, things like that, where you don't rely on movement, but you're relying on just anatomy or anatomical structure, these filters are helpful. They make those, the image more smooth. They make it look a lot better. Uh, they reduce some artifacts. But with lung ultrasound, we're relying on movement and we're relying on artifact to give us the image that we're looking for. And so we want these, these filters turned off. Um, and if you pick these presets, it will by default have these filters turned off. So let's change gears now and talk about lung findings for COVID-19 itself, right? And as we talk about lung ultrasound for coronavirus, we need to take a step back and think for a minute about what coronavirus does or what COVID-19 does. Remember, it's a small virus, that 120 nanometer uh, diameter particle, that attaches itself to mucosal surfaces of the respiratory tree. Remember, it attached, its spike proteins attach to the ACE2 receptors, which are found in many places throughout the body, but not least of which is in the respiratory tree, giving it upper respiratory symptoms as well as lower respiratory symptoms. And when in the lungs, it causes a viral pneumonia, right? So... If you think back to that histology slide that we saw earlier of the alveoli with the very thin walled uh, septations, right? This looks very different, right? And this is what exactly what, and it's going to do exactly what we would expect it to do. When you have pneumonia, when you have infil or inflammation and infection inside the lungs, it's going to cause thickening, thickening of that interstitial space due to the inflammatory cellular infiltration, but also as well as the inflammatory edema that comes. And we're also going to see filling of those alveoli with the fluid and the inflammatory debris, right? And this is exactly what we see in here. We see thickening of the interstitial space, right, as well as inflammatory debris inside the alveoli. Right. And radiographically, this presents with patchy areas of ground glass opacity initially that progress to more of a consolidated or retic reticular appearance with air bronchograms. Right? We see the progression here from, uh, from ground glass opacities in the lungs, representing some early inflammation, all the way down here to that more reticular pattern representing consolidation of those lungs and even these little thin areas of, uh, of air, the air bronchograms, um, inside those consolidations. So if you think about it, we have progressed from a well aerated lung, right, to one with an increasing fluid to air ratio, or as I've been saying earlier in the lecture, air to fluid ratio. So the air, ratio, air portion goes down, the fluid portion goes up, right? We have more fluid to air, um, you know, as this disease progresses. And so what we see on ultrasound that we talked about a little bit ago should match what we're seeing here uh, on the CT scan, right? Now, when we talk about lung ultrasound in the context of coronavirus, we need to remember something, right? We need to remember one really important thing. These findings are representative of viral pneumonia. What we're gonna talk about is viral pneumonia, right? That is, they can be seen in COVID-19, right? Certainly our findings of COVID-19, but are not necessarily specific for this diagnosis over other forms of viral pneumonia, right? Any viral pneumonia can present similarly, right? And you will have to clinically interpret the findings in, in the broader context of your patient uh, to really kind of make that diagnosis. So in the spring and summer of 2020, if you see this, yeah, it's probably coronavirus. But if you fast forward to 2023, when we this thing is hopefully over, 
um, and you see these findings, it may not represent coronavirus. It may represent some other viral etiology, but these findings are suggestive of, of a viral pneumonia, right? So that being said, the first hallmark for ultrasound for, for viral pneumonia, or in this case, COVID-19, is the location, right? This is the first thing that we need to think about and we need to talk about. The findings will be focal and scattered, right? This will differentiate it from other things that you may see, other causes of beelines that you'll see on ultrasound like cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which will be diffuse, right? Viral pneumonia is focal and scattered. Now, maybe unilateral, maybe bilateral. In fact, it's oftentimes bilateral, but it should be focal and scattered. There'll be areas of normal lung adjacent to areas of diseased lung, which contrasts from other things, right? We use cardiogenic pulmonary edema as the example because um, that's the extreme where everything's diffuse and bilateral versus focal unilateral. Other things to think about in the setting of trauma, right? Pulmonary contusions will have focal unilateral beelines, but you should have a story that goes along with that. Lobar pneumonia, a bacterial lobar pneumonia, on the other hand, will be focal, but it may not present with as many beelines, maybe more of a consolidated, lobar consolidated thing. So focal and scattered, oftentimes bilateral findings on ultrasound in the context of a patient who's got fever, respiratory symptoms, should be viral pneumonia, right? So when we do the lung ultrasound, we want to divide up the thorax into different zones so that we can easily reproduce our findings to communicate to others in a standardized way. I mean, medicine is the art of reproducibility or, or science is the art of reproducibility. We want to reproduce our findings so we can validate them. And we also communicate them for efficient handoff of patient care. Um, there's an article in press right now as of the time of this recording that came out of Italy um, that is basically laying out a framework that they believe should be utilized internationally for how to protocolize ultrasound in the context of coronavirus. Um, and they really are trying to, to, to build on what's kind of already known. And they found that the most common place to see findings of coronavirus uh, was in the right posterior basal segment followed by the left posterior segment. So while coronavirus can be in any of these different locations, in this, in this image, zone one and then four through six are the most common places that they identified findings of coronavirus. So it'd be helpful for us as we go through and scan the patients, we really want to focus in on the posterior, right? The posterior bases, because uh, that's going to be where the biggest bang for the buck is going to be in scanning these patients. Now, if we back up and remember normal lung ultrasound, right? Remember the normal, the pleural line is thin and crisp, right? There'll be an A profile predominance with few to no B lines, right? This is what's considered normal. You have your rib, rib, your pleural line, maybe a reverberation artifact. You don't see any B lines in here, right? In viral pneumonia, initially what you'll see is an increase in B lines with pleural indentation representing kind of the inflammatory change that are occurring at that location. So in this patient, you'll see rib, rib, and then the pleural line, you can see it moving back and forth. And right between the two, you'll see this little indentation. I'll take this off, um, take the cursor off over here. And you'll see that little indentation as it moves back and forth right? And around that indentation, you see some B lines, right? You can probably count three or four of these things as they're moving between that, it, that rib space, right? And this is the early initial findings that you'll see as, a, as, a, as that lesion develops in that location of the lung. And this correlates with the ground glass opacities that are seen on the CT scans. Now, this is the image that the Italians provided in their study that we referred to earlier. And I think it's a really helpful image because it's very crisp and clear. Uh, but you can see that there's multiple B lines. You can see them with the, the indicated by the arrows and these little indentations of the plural line kind of at the at the red arrows as um, as you have that beginning stages of that subplural consolidation. But the B lines kind of highlighting where those things are at. Right. Here's another example of an increased B lines. Uh, from our case files, basically an area representing ground glass opacification um, on the CT scan. And so what you see is the, the pleural line moving back and forth in a, a myriad of B lines that are extending from the pleural line and extending deep. And you can probably even see the, the resolution is not terribly great, but you can see some indentation or some wavy appearance along that B line, especially over right over here as you kind of watch that one go back and forth. As these areas progress, patients will develop what's called a subpleural consolidation in, in these areas, right? In the areas where the, the disease is kind of developing. 
uh, and what we see on ultrasound is kind of this ragged border. If you look right over here, you can see kind of a, a consolidation beginning to form and just kind of a shredded appearance to that pleural line, right? And this is called the shred sign. It represents consolidation along that pleural line. Um, because this represents the area of the lung where the alveoli are, are filled with fluid and inflammatory debris, they'll kind of have that more of a solid tissue type appearance, right? And there's a there's going to be a surrounding halo uh, of tissue, or you can call it a penumbra of tissue kind of around it, that's still aerated, right? You don't have some fluid-filled alveoli uh, around it. Uh, you have some inflammation, but, but still with, uh, with air in there. And that's going to give you that beeline appearance around it, or as the Italian said, the white lung appearance. So you'll see kind of a, a hyper, you know, echoic whitish appearance kind of around these consolidations um, you know, as they move back and forth. Here's another example of a subpleural consolidation uh, that gives that appearance of a shredded or the shredded appearance of the pleural line. And note the consolidation, or note that inside the consolidation there's echogenic foci um, that represent um, lesions that are or spots in that lung that aren't completely deaerated, right? So as the fluid fills, there's still going to be little spots of air that that are in the terminal bronchi um, or in, or in some of the alveoli. As you watch this consolidation go back and forth you'll see it has that tissue appearance as well as some, some little speckles inside of it. And again, surrounding this area are going to be bee lines, you know, or that white lung appearance that represents that inflamed penumbra that is not yet consolidated. Here's another example from that Italian study that we refer to. It shows the, the pleura, right, and these subpleural consolidations associated with bee lines, right? So here is that consolidation, that discontinuity of the pleura, that ragged, shredded appearance with the bee lines around it that represents the subpleural consolidation. But you can still see areas of normal lung peeking through the curtain of bee lines. And here's yet another example from our file showing that ragged pleural line with subpleural consolidations and that bee pattern that's deep to that, right? So you see. Uh, the right in here that ragged appearance to that pleural line and significant bee lines surrounding it running deep into the far field and finally as things continue to progress you'll see a worsening of the lung consolidation right these may be extensive or become extensive lobar consolidations or, or much larger consolidations up here on the top left we see an example of a consolidation with those little air bronchograms inside of it and that kind of that white lung or the bee the B profile uh, surrounding it, um, all the way down to just confluent B lines, right? That curtain, that B curtain that covers up the A profile. And in fact, if you look at the D panel here, you can see in, in the green box the A profile, a normal A profile. And then just as things become uh, more and more extensive, you'll just see a confluence of those B lines, maybe not individual lines, but just that diffuse light and fog appearance uh, of, of that confluent B, B profile. So these findings have led the Italians to propose a standardized zoning and scoring system that we referred to earlier so that coronavirus lung ultrasound is reproducible, right? And this will allow us to communicate our colleagues or communicate our findings to our colleagues and consultants as well as as well as to allow us to accurately monitor the progression of lesions. And I personally really like this protocol, the one that they they proposed. Um, and in the emergency department, we've decided to adopt this protocol as to how we zone the lung and then kind of the, the progression of findings. Um, you know, for, for coronavirus patients. And as we mentioned earlier, there are two anterior, two lateral, and three posterior lung zones. And this really follows the international um, consensus guidelines for lung ultrasound with two anterior and two lateral lung zones. And it just adds those three, uh, three zones. So what we already teach, we just add three more zones in the back and we, we kind of have this protocol. Now, if you've noticed, the numbering here starts differently than the international guidelines. So the international guidelines starts their numbering one through four up in the anterior lung fields. Here, it starts the, the numbering in the posterior lung fields and moves up, right? Personally, I don't really care, right? It becomes important in terms of the, um, the communicating back and forth which zone you're talking about. But I think if we adopt a qualitative labeling system, it really accomplishes the same goal, right? So what we've decided to do in the emergency department and what our documentation reflects is basically describing this thing as anterior upper, anterior lower, lateral upper or lower, and then posterior upper, mid or lower segments, right? So if you qualify it, it accomplishes the same goal, gets the same message across and utilizes this division uh, of the thorax into various different lung zones.
Now, when it comes to scoring, the Italians have classified normal lung as zero, right? So if you have an A profile, if you've got normal appearing lung, that area is scored as zero. And it will have, like I said, a thin, crisp, plural line, uh, lack of significant B lines, and pretty much an A profile predominance like we see in these images here. When you start adding B lines with that plural indentation, that's what they score as a, as a uh, score one, right? Uh, the plural line is still continuous, right? You don't have consolidations, but you have those B lines in that indentation. Once you start shredding up that plural line, once you start having those subplural consolidations, is when you get your you get yourself into a score of two, right? And score two is characterized by breaks in the plural line or shred sign in that beginning of consolidations in that surrounding halo of white long or B lines around those consolidations, right? And score three is characterized by basically larger or more dense consolidations um, and then large areas of confluent B lines or white lungs. So there's there's a little bit of um, clinical decision between score two and score three. But as those B lines become less distinct and be, just become more confluent, you would give this patient, or at least that, that zone, a score of, a, of, of three. Now what the number is, I'm not sure it really matters. I don't know if there's any data to say if you score a certain value, your risk of whatever is gonna be, you know, whatever. But I think it's helpful, you know, to think through the progression of disease so that when you serially monitor these patients, you can see the progression, you know, from a score of one to a score of two to a score of three and understand what the progression of disease is gonna be um, in these patients. Now, before we wrap up, I don't want to take a minute to talk about ARDS, right? This is going to be a big topic, and really this is going to be the, the cause of mortality for patients. If you get a little bit of viral pneumonia, you're going to feel lousy. You'll likely recover. Um, but if you get ARDS, this is going to have a high mortality, right? Um, so I think it's important that we think about ARDS, especially in the context of, of ultrasound and what we're looking for, right? So the Berlin definition of ARDS is basically an acute, diffuse, inflammatory lung injury leading to an increased pulmonary vascular permeability, increased lung weight, and loss of aerated lung tissue with hypoxemia and bilateral radiographic capacities associated with increased venous admixture, increased physiological dead space, and decreased lung compliance. That's a mouthful. But I think simply stated, ARDS is basically um, diffuse inflammation throughout the entire lung, right? Which differentiates it from pneumonia, right? Pneumonia will be focal and scattered, but this is just the this becomes diffuse inflammation. The whole lung is inflamed, leading to a decreased ability to oxygenate and ventilate the patient. And there's a definite need for mechanical ventilation, right? So these patients are often vented. You have difficulty oxygenating them, and you have diffuse inflammatory changes. Now, you can talk about the various different degrees of ARDS, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe based on your P to F ratio. Um, that certainly is beyond the course of this topic. Um, but in a nutshell, it's diffuse inflammation throughout the entire lung, causing difficulty with oxygenation and ventilation, right? Sonographically, it's going to appear the same as what we've already talked about, right? You're not going to be able to put the probe down and say, oh, this is ARDS. Now, it may suggest it if you see extensive disease in every single lung field, right? That may be helpful in making that diagnosis, but there is no pathognomonic finding on ultrasound that says this is ARDS, right? Um, the diagnosis, like I said, can be assisted, but ultimately made on clinical grounds based on your PDF ratios and kind of what they're doing on the vent. So it's a clinical diagnosis assisted with sonography. That being said, ultrasound can help you monitor the progression of the disease and, um, and clue you into the fact that this may be something that's coming uh, if you see worsening of disease and kind of worsening of extension of where this disease happens to be, right? So as we wrap things up, let's go back and briefly review, right? Lung ultrasound is composed of a bunch of artifacts, right? And they are created by the air and tissue interface, right? In a normal lung, you have crisp, continuous, mobile, plural line with reverberation artifacts or that A profile. This is normal, right? As that air to fluid ratio changes, right? As the air portion comes down, the fluid portion goes up, you'll begin to have B lines appear. At, and they, they show up as white lines that begin at the plural line, or the, yeah, the plural line, and extend all the way to the far field. And you can see up to three per rib interspace uh, as normal, but anything beyond that is really considered pathologic. And these are seen in viral pneumonia, but they can also be seen in any entity that will thicken, that will cause increased thickness of the interstitial lung or interstitial space of the lung. So you really have to put on your clinical hat and look at what you're seeing, apply that to the patient in front of you and decide kind of how that fits the pattern of, 
you know, of what's going on with the patient. That being said, in viral pneumonia broadly, you know, and even in coronavirus specifically, you'll begin to see an increasing number of B lines, right? Beginning with that indentation of the pleural line, and then it's going to progress to uh, to the shredding of that pleural line, right? In the beginnings of the subpleural consolidations with that surrounding B profile um, haloing around those different lesions, right? And as this progresses even further, you'll begin to see larger and larger areas consolidation and a confluence of those B lines with complete loss of that A profile. So thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and ask.